great. Thank you. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Will Yoon to you. Many of you already know him. Will was uh, hails from uh, Loyola, where he did his fellowship and uh, was involved with a program there uh, looking at advancements in uh, management for complex aortic disease. He came here with that uh, interest about a year and a half ago. We were very fortunate to recruit him, and he's been a uh, terrific addition uh, as we expand our vascular program and the aortic center uh, specifically. Uh, in his short time here, he's already had a number of abstracts accepted to some uh, national meetings, and we're really looking forward to his ongoing academic and clinical success. Uh, he's going to speak to us about some of these current trends and innovations in complex aortic surgery. So please uh, uh, welcome Dr. Yoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Mel. Um, good morning. Um, really here to tell you about the current trends in um, what we call complex aortic uh, surgeries, but you know, one's uh, passionate topic can be a very boring topic to many others. So I really wanted to tell you um, stories as to where the, our current trend comes from, because to understand what we think would happen in the future, we really have to understand where the certain surgical techniques come, originate from. So, um, and also, uh, what I've learned is when you're giving a talk, it's always good to follow someone who gave a poor talk, but it's really hard to follow many great speakers before, you know, um, you know telemedicine, palliative care, and of course, Dr. Mel's environmental talk, which is really hard to beat. So I've learned if you have very difficult speaker to follow, find something that you can um, compensate with, which is uh, find a video clip. So this is, uh, I have a consulting role at Cook Medical and the Gore, which is my disclosure for endografts. And this is a video. Very good. Dr. Chickering will now cauterize the anterior wall. Well, it seems the old girl's not out to pasture yet. Might explode, but at least it won't electrocute you. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's not too late for a career in the law. Oh, cheer up. You've got a much better chance of survival than this fellow. I've located the aneurysm. It makes the aorta look like it has a balloon on top. Take a, take a feel, Bertie. Palpate the distal side. Won't even stay firm against a pulse. It's lost all of its form. It's miraculous. It hasn't already ruptured and killed him. It's only a matter of time. Hunter's ligation. Resect the weak spot, try to reconstruct? Yeah, with an aneurysm that large, once we resect it, there won't be much tissue left with which to reconstruct the artery. We have to try. We do indeed. Nurse Pell? Holding steady at 110 bits per minute. Once we clamp the pedicle, we're on the clock, as ischemia is very possible. Where is Nurse Elkins today? She's taking the shift on the post-operative ward for Nurse Monk. It seems our young Bertram is unusually aware of Nurse Elkins' whereabouts. You seem very interested as well. Clamp it, Everett. Forceps. You need to hold that while I excise that edge. Shredding like paper. 140 beats per minute. Give me some of that rubber tubing, then support the inside of the artery while you sew around it. There's nothing to work with. It's in shreds. Stay cool, Everett. Just do what you can do and continue to press on. All right. Now I'm going to remove the tubing, and you close the hole behind it. No, it's not going to hold. Well, he'll certainly die if we don't try. All right. One, two, three. So, <laughs> just in case anyone hasn't heard audible bleeding, that would be considered as an audible bleeding. So much has changed since then. Um, so, you know, not everyone dies in the operating room, although in a men conference you see uh, our mortalities quite often. Um, but, and we, of course, had better anesthesia. As you can see, the patient was intubated. Uh, this is before that time. And also, we had materials to fix the aneurysm instead of just trying to primary repair like the, the old hernia surgery used to be. Of course, we have a mesh uh, to help with that. And same with aortic surgery. But, of course, that's part of innovation, isn't it? Uh, because at the time, no one had thought of it. Or maybe perhaps they have thought of it, but there were simply no materials to use. 
So first use of such thing is uh, one of the articles from, I believe from France, is resection of the aneurysm and replacing with thoracic aorta from another patient. Um, this is um, the angiogram. There was such thing back then. And um, of course, they, uh, the, the one on your right, oh, sorry, patient, your left, rather. It's really confusing sometimes. Um, is this side is a preoperative angiogram. Of course, you can see the uh, full extent of aneurysm because you're only looking at the inner uh, fillings of contrast. Um, but this was replaced with 20 year old uh, uh, patient's uh, thoracic aorta. And the uh, one on uh, your right side is a postoperative angiogram, which was successful. And patient actually lived um, um, about three to five months later, and they had a follow up exam. Of course, back then, they didn't have really good follow up. Um, protocols, I suppose, so um, patient was no longer seen after, so we don't know true uh, survival of this procedure, but as you can see, technically doable, because back then, a lot of people would argue, why are you doing aneurysm surgery if everyone is dying left and right? So this uh, really showed that technically is something that we can achieve. But of course, it's important, just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it, right? Um, just, just like... Um, what is that uncle from Spider-Man movie, Great Power Comes with Great Responsibility? We have to be sure that it, we're actually helping patients, not doing surgery for our own ego's sake. Um, and this is um, the picture that I showed you is Dr. Zalagi. Many would remember him. Um, he's a surgeon who uh, worked in Detroit for many years. He still used to come to the hospital when he reached, I think, about 100 years old. He still had a very clear mind. Um, so this is uh, one of the landmark paper that is a landmark, yet no one truly remembers anymore. So um, back, in, uh, back in the day, I suppose, they followed the patients with um, patients who had aneurysm less than 6 centimeter and also the, um, uh, larger than 6 centimeter. So 6 centimeter was a cutoff where they determined this was small and large aneurysm. And they've, um, it was a randomized trial, but they looked at their patients whom they have operated versus they have observed. And it clearly showed survival um, um, uh, benefit of the surgery. So this is the first um, one of the paper that showed that surgery for aneurysm has survival benefit. And of course, it's, I think it's important to address what the aneurysm is, not the definition per se, but really cl anatomical classification. One is thoracic abdominal aneurysm, as you can see here. One through four is Dr. Crawford's classification. Five was added by Dr. Safi. And this is uh, thoracic abdominal aneurysm. And these aneurysms are repaired in open fashion, which is gold standard, because they're most durable if one can tolerate, and is repaired in, uh, in such way. And of course, Infrarenal aneurysm. These are none of our simple infrarenal aneurysms. And the one starting from left to right, the A would be considered as complex um, aortic aneurysm um, because it's close proximity to uh, renal arteries. And B, which we call juxtarenal. C, once the, the, uh, the branch vessels involved in the aneurysm that is called pararenal. And D would be paravisceral. E would be a type 4 thoracic abdominal aneurysm. In the United States, D and E are really considered thoracic abdominal aneurysm because if you were to do open surgery, the exposure is a little bit um, just similar to thoracic abdominal approach. And of course, this is the final version of repair. And, and as you can see, most of the open repair um, uh, repairs in such a way that normal anatomy is preserved. So, Thoracic abdominal aneurysm, this is a minimally invasive single incision surgery, as you can see, <laughs> instead of many different ports, which our minimally minimum invasive surgeons used to always tease to our, one of our surgical oncologists, how come your incisions are so big? And our surgical uh, oncologists used to say, at least I use single incision. So this is probably one of the biggest surgery you can do to one in terms of aortic surgeries go, because exposure is so large. and. Of course, when you do clamp and such, the hemodynamically it changes quite often, so anesthesia staff has to be really dedicated to this type of surgery. And a lot of times we need additional circuit to be able to um, get the patient through the surgery safely. And of course, we know Dr. Rodriguez who is able to put patients on pump help with this surgery. And during my training, I also had a mentor, Dr. Cho, who was able to do this as a vascular surgeon, which is quite a rare thing nowadays. This is a um, final picture of the complete repair. But 
that Thor could dominate aneurysm repair in open fashion. At the time, that was a very innovative surgery, and still is today because it's technically very challenging and physiologically really hard to manage intraoperatively and postoperatively. But let's look at the, um, some of the well-established surgeons. Many would recognize them. One, of course, on the top is Dr. Crawford, one in the middle, Dr. Safi, one the bottom, Dr. Caselli. They've operated a lot, I can tell you that. Look at their numbers, 1,500 patients. They did thoracal dominant aneurysm repairs. Dr. Safi, almost 1,900. Dr. Caselli, 3,300. When patients ask you, how many surgeries have you done? Very few can quote, I've done just about 3,000 surgeries. Uh, but let's look at their outcomes. Mortality for Dr. Um, Crawford's data was 10%. Spinal cord ischemia rate of 16%. Dr. Safi, almost mortality of 16%. Spinal cord ischemia, 9.7%. Dr. Caselli, mortality of 7.5%. And spinal cord ischemia, 9.6%. By no means, they're all same patients. And of course, they all have different uh, morbidities. And they all have different, I mean, they're operating at different institutions, so they have different setups. So it's not just the technical issues, but of course it's the system issues as well. But you can argue that this is probably the best result you can get because they've been doing it so much at the same institution over and over. This is perfect as it can get. They're literally the 300 Spartans of surgery. No one can beat them. I suppose you can beat anyone, but um, they're sort of like godfather of thoracic abdominal surgery with the other skill set. For those who are too young to understand who they are, Yoda and Godfather and 300, they're like Avengers of our time. <laughs> you really can't beat them. So what about for all the rest of us, Padawan learners, who understand way of the force, yet we haven't mastered them, not just as a surgeon, as an institution. Um, so this is California's data of thoracic abdominal repair. Look at our number. 30-day overall mortality is 19%. And most patients who we do thoracic abdominal surgeries are in age group of 70s or greater. And look at California's one-year mortality. 70-year-old and above are about 35%. And in the 80s, they're, we're looking at 40% one-year mortality. This is way too high, and these are elective repairs, not for rupture. And we're not alone, this is Seattle's um, um, data and, uh, at University of Washington, whom we would argue as one of the large um, uh, center where, which, where they're doing a lot of these thoracic abdominal surgeries. And, and their report of mortality is 16.7%, I'm sorry, 16 with sp a permanent spinal cord ischemia rate of close to 19%. And look at their endovascular group, mortality of 4%, permanent spinal cord ischemia rate of 11.8%. This is a huge difference, right? Um, so, and they're not alone. Of course, Dr. Rory Greenberg, who has been pioneering surgeon, or he's of course recently passed, had um, really, really remarkable um, outcomes. Elected mortality rate of 6%. This is early 2000 data. And Tara Mastracci, of course, took on afterward and published more um, data in, re in regards to this type of repair. And when they've improved, they had elected mortality of 3%. And of course, since then, many have followed the suit since um, Tim Shooters and Roy Greenberg's um, early invention of these endografts and early adopters such as Professor Verhoeven in Germany, um, uh, Haolan in France, and uh, Matt Eagleton, of course, now in the Mass General, and Tim Resch in uh, uh, Malmö, Sweden. And they were the early adopters, but if you look at, um, or if you were to search at PubMed, number of publications have skyrocketed since, um, since the early invention of such endografts because Many recognize this is a better way to treat very sick patients who can tolerate open surgery. So, but to understand this innovation, we have to start from the beginning again. This is Dr. Uh, um, Forsman. He was an intern. So any of you are interned in this room, please raise your hand. 
So think what you can do during your intern year. Be um, uh, at least uh, recognize there are a lot of things that you do as an intern year can mean a lot. So Dr. Forsman was an intern in Germany who thought to do um, catheterization of the heart through, um, a, for, through a venous approach, which is a very novel idea. Of course, they had this regulations, just like any hospitals, right? You can't just start doing things on patients. And so he thought to try to do it on animals, but they also had animal rights law where they couldn't do these experiments on animals. But there was no regulation on doing it on yourself. So, of course, he did it on himself, and at the time, there was no endovascular tools, right, because it's, the thought of it hasn't even come about. So he, used, um, he went to a urology office and got a wires and, and stents. He was able to percutaneous access right heart. And, of course, to prove it, you have to take an x-ray, right? So he walked down to the radiology department, took an x-ray of himself, and, of course, later he got fired for doing that, but he won Nobel Prize a couple of years later. Trade-off, I would say. Um, of course, he couldn't practice surgery anymore. He became, becomes a urologist later. This quote, <laughs> but, but no disrespect to a urologist. Uh, it was just, just stating the fact. Um, so this is a quote from a really well-known surgeon. Um, so let me just read out loud. This is, in 1976, not too long ago, uh, it was a resident at Cleveland Clinic, and we had two consecutive patients who had bad outcomes after AAA repair. Not thoracic abdominal, AAA repair. I thought to myself, if in this high-quality hospital with superb surgeons, the results of this operation are not always good. The cause should be inherent to the procedure, which is too traumatic for these old and debilitated patients. And this was said none other than uh, Juan Perotti, who is also in, um, the person to um, um, do an EVAR for the first time, and, or at least to publish. So every story deserves some, you know, um, storytelling, I suppose. And, and he received a phone call from an Argentinian president who supposedly said, my secret service has told me you are doing something new for aneurysms. Uh, my cousin has an aneurysm, back pain, severe chronic, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, so please use it in him. Of course, he answered the phone call, and he supposedly said, I explained the procedure, showed angiograms of before and after the procedure, and they said, you have a lot of experience. I said, wait, those are dogs. <laughs> you are going to be the first human. Of course, uh, you know, the, the story goes that the surgeon went actually quite well, and he wanted to publish his result. When something is new, there is always resistance. It was not met with very kind reception when they tried to publish in JVS, and this was also not just followed by re rejection of the paper, followed by much criticism, which I did not in include in this presentation. Um, so he ended up publishing this report in Annals of Vascular Surgery. And um, you will understand how, of course, this is early design, where much of the components are no longer used, but the concept is what's important. And this is 2013 data. And as you can see, this is seven years ago. We're 2020, so you know, it's, um, time goes by very quickly, I suppose. But um, as you can see, most of aneurysms are now being repaired in an endovascular fashion. And let's not forget one of our um, you know, um, very important vascular surgeons that no one has heard of. This is Dr. Velotis. He's a uh, vascular surgeon who had a lot of interest in mechanical engineering from Soviet Union. And he had patented this particular stent graft, which you can fold, or compress rather, and have self-expanding radial force. Very simple design, yet very important um, design. Of course, he patented, given Soviet national, you have to go through Soviet Union's patent office. You can't just go to United States patent office, knock on door, because then who knows what might happen to you. So, um, so he patented this particular design in 1984. But you will understand, uh, you have to understand that, unfortunately, because of our political issues, West did not recognize their patent office. So three months later, our American company comes along and patents the same design which tells us how important this design is. That's the story of simple EVAR. 
that's as simple as you can get. Unfortunately, you don't see these simple infrarena aneurysm quite often, especially when you're at tertiary uh, centers, because of course these can be done safely and reasonably well at out, you know, at different institutions as well. Now the story of challenging anatomy and, and, and trying to repair this endovascular way. Again, Dr. Roy Greenberg has pioneered in this area. And initially, this is, um, you can see uh, what we call sort of a parallel graph because there are two graphs in parallel fashion. This was not done because of um, he had this, you know, he had this moment where, ah, we can do it this way. It mainly came from because he accidentally covered renal artery at one time and it was a salvage maneuver. And after that, he thought, perhaps we can use this technique in a more challenging anatomy. And hence the birth of what we call parallel graphs. And you know, there are many different terms, but they're all under parallel graph family, where it's chimney graph, just because it looks like chimney, and periscopes, because it looks like periscope. If anyone has seen uh, some marine movies or Indiana Jones, you would understand. And that's what we call sandwich technique, because there's one graph here that's sandwiched in between two uh, main aorta graphs. And of course, during that time, Roy Greenberg has also pioneered in what we call fenestrated graphs. So since then, we got this something like this monster here um, has come about. So, and within fenestrated graphs, there are many different designs. Uh, you can uh, de uh, define them into one off-the-shelf device and the patient-specific device. Off-the-shelf meaning that the, this particular design can be used in, used in uh, many patients, but not for all. And what, starting from left to right, left, uh, the first one is Cook um, uh, T-Branch device, and the next is Gore Tanby devices. I think it stands for thoracic abdominal multi-branch endoprosthesis. And one, uh, the third one from the left would be Yotex, which is German company now acquired by our American company, um, called um, this is also off-the-shelf branch device, and this would be the Medtronic um, um, thoracoid thoracoid abdominal device, which was initially invented or thought of by uh, one of vascular surgeons, um, Pat Kelly, and of course now we have patient-specific device where the grafts are manufactured for patient's anatomy, not the other way around, where we're trying to fit graft to every anatomy possible, but really making a graft for each patient's anatomy, which ideally should have the best outcome. So um, this is one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Bashar, and I wanted to show you one of the cases where we did parallel graft technique, and later I'm hoping to show you um, the, the fenestrated technique, so this way you can see both. Long story short, this is a patient who had a thoracic abdominal aneurysm, but um, during his early days, they had only repaired infrarenal aorta. So of course, thoracic and thoracic abdominal portion of the aorta had become aneurysm or even more, where we had to do repair. Okay. So the one on the left shows angiogram of the thoracic abdominal portion. As you can see, um, there are two renal arteries here and here. And on this picture, we have cannulated bilateral renal arteries from femoral approach. And um, let me move that mouse, my cursor. And from axillary approach, we have placed in a celiac and SMA stents on the far left, of course, before we did that with a T-bar, so this way we can put those parallel graphs as a sandwich fashion as you have seen the figure before. As you can see, the, the bridging stents for the celiac and SMA are within the, uh, um, the T-bar device above, and we're putting an additional T-bar device to sandwich those bridging graphs. And there is a, a picture of sandwich. And as you can see, there is an angiogram of completion um, showing patent celiac and SMA and patent renal graft in a um, periscope fashion. So, as, uh, but you know, I think vascular surgeons and some residents can um, recognize this, what we call gutter endo leak. That's a big problem. And many people have sought to answer this question, is this really a problem? And do we see this often? So this is one of the large uh, parallel graph trial, or study rather, 
uh, which we call Protagoras uh, trial, and there's another trial that was um, largely done in the United States called Pericles. Um, uh, they both say the same thing. 100% technical success rate, very, very low type 1A endolic, um, and really good primary patency rates of said graph. But as we know, and this is why we hold journal call, when you read journal, you always have to read with skepticism, right? Because there is always fine print. To achieve these result, you have to have approximate landing zones more than 50 millimeter. And because there's always a gutter in between those graphs, and as we know, the resistance increases, length increases, and that's the idea behind having large overlap. And to do that, you also had to have least amount of chimney graphs as possible. 1.5 chimney was their mean, uh, mean uh, not used um, parallel graphs. And I can tell you, there you cannot have 1.5. Either you have one or two, which means most patients had one or two. And, but we know the, to meet those strict anatomic criteria is very, very difficult because we are born with certain anatomy which prevents us from doing that. And this is a P-branch trial where they have mapped all renal arteries and celiac arteries and SMA arteries. And to meet those criteria is anatomically almost impossible. And very few patients would meet that anatomic criteria. And of course, as in France, Professor Haulon had looked at all French data, which is great about European nations that they're easy to pull national data very easily. So they had 20, 257 patients who had parallel graph. And their outcome was such that they had 11.2% uh, 11 of death and extremely high in re-intervention rates of 15%. This is a huge problem when we, do, when we speak about endovascular techniques because re-intervention rate is one of the Achilles heel of endovascular interventions because um, the procedures adds a lot of cost and, and recent um, uh, there's, at least there's a bit of a drama in the vascular world where NHS, the National Health Service of UK, had proposed that anyone who can tolerate surgery should not be offered uh, endovascular interventions at all. And of course, which wasn't adopted, but which provoked a lot of um, drama, I suppose. So I visited many different institutions, what we called high, um, uh, or referring centers, if you will, um, true quaternary centers where they do hundreds of cases, unlike our definition, because they really refer most patients to very designated, very few centers. And that's Sweden and this is Germany. I visited mainly to see how, what their workflow is like, how they set up their cases, what instruments they use, and how they're managed postoperatively. And what I've also learned is that many of the cases they measure are also measured at the aortic um, uh, planning center Imagine if you're just planning cases all every day, uh, you know, Monday through Friday, just planning cases, that's all you do. You have to be good at it, right? Otherwise, you probably won't have that job. So I was asked to write a review article about this matter of a parallel graph versus fenestral graph. And after visiting and seeing many different techniques, I've come to the conclusion that parallel graph is indeed a great technique, but perhaps should be only used for symptomatic and urgent settings where fenestrate or custom made graphs are not available to that patient because it's really hard to standardize techniques that we can't really standardize. So this is fenestrate graph and there are many different definitions and it can be very confusing. FIVAR, BVAR, and really the fenestration means that we have a hole and there's a, a aortic wall that's in direct contact to that fenestration of the graph and then we have one bridging stent. Fenestrate branches where we no longer have that at position, and we have bridging stents going to the branch vessel, and this is what we call direction of branch. So this is technically what we call BVAR, and this will be a BVAR. And of course, we got very creative, so many graphs they have combination of both, which makes it, I don't even know how to say it, at B and BVAR, I suppose. But now let's look at the anatomy again, as to why I believe finish repair is the future, not the parallel graph. Just like how we used to do open surgery, we try to, if we can do it, we would like to repair patients in anatomic fashion, right? Because preserving one's normal anatomy has best outcome and best patency compared to extra anatomic bypass. And I believe the same is true for endovascular approach. We should have repair thoracic abdominal uh, aneurysm endovascular fashion, yet just like how we would do open surgery. 
because we've been doing open surgery for decades and we know how durable it is if we can do this safely. And, and of course, fenestry repair should be no different from that. So in fact, fantasy repair has been so successful, many center, including one in Nuremberg, Germany, has been offering this as a first line of therapy instead of open repair. And this is their transition of um, changes to how they repair fenestry repair. So a blue bar would be what we call simple fevar, two vessel fevar, and orange bars are three or four vessel fevars. And this is up to years 2016. This is the most recent data, which I, I borrowed from my friends who's over there. And as you can see, 96% of cases now are done in, in a um, more complex manner, which shows a transition of simple fever design to more complex in order to decrease secondary interventions. Just because aorta appears normal adjacent to aneurysm aorta doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that aorta is actually healthy. And we have recognized those degeneration of those aorta. So the idea is to move higher into healthy aorta, so this way that the secondary intervention during that one's lifetime would be minimized. And this is our UC Davis data, which we follow a similar trend, where it used to be that we used to do just two vessel fever. And, and, and from August 2019 to December, half of our cases were three or four vessel fever. And allow me to show one of our case, very similar in anatomy and very similar story. This patient also had thoracal abdominal aneurysm repair, but only had infrarenal open repair more than 10 years ago. And of course, we see this a lot when, you know, when patient didn't have complete repair, the, the part of the artery that was aneurysm becomes of an issue. And of course, at older age, it's more difficult to repair. And as you can see, we briefly spoke about dehiscence. Of course, this is loss of domain, and, and, and from general uh, surgery residency, that's something that I never really knew how to truly fix because that's a very difficult problem. So entering the abdomen would have been very, very difficult. So first, what we do is, um, as endovascular therapy has um, become more complicated, our preoperative planning has become more complicated. And of course, we get a CTA of the patients, and they have to be ordered in such a way that we have very, very thin slices. So this way, we can do precise measurements of endografts. After that, you really have to study one's anatomy. When you go into battle, you don't just show up with a with, uh, weapon, I suppose, and, and try to figure out as you go. That works in Hollywood, but that doesn't work in real life. You have to plan for it. Same with the surgery. When you come to surgery, you have to be prepared for it and you have to understand one's anatomy. And of course, then we come up with the device plan, what we are going to use, what bridging stents we're going to use, and then we uh, do the surgery. So this is the first stage of a T-VAR, where the endograph is, um, uh, this is left anterior oblique uh, projection, and the T-VAR is deployed. And we actually wait month or uh, month to uh, six weeks to take the patient back to, in order to decrease spinal cord ischemia, which we'll discuss later. And month or six weeks later, we bring in the fenestry device. And it's kind of like going into space, you know, you meet those graphs into another spent graph and dock there. And the celiac, um, you know, fenestration is uh, open. And of course, then we um, cannulate the celiac artery and you do a confirmation picture. Very important. A lot of times we forget because we're in a hurry. Very important that we confirm we cannulate the correct artery because there's no salvage maneuver if you were to um, cannulate the wrong artery and the wrong fenestration, really. Then we move on to um, SMA, and we cannulate that. And, of course, we do a confirmatory angiogram. And then you do right renal artery followed by uh, left renal artery. So once every um, um, arteries are cannulated through the fenestrations, so then you um, stent the fenestrations, and then you what we call flare the uh, stent. So it's kind of nice conical shape 
So in our mind, that seals the fenestration well and has better fluid dynamics. And of course, then you do a completion angiogram, which should run, but didn't run. And you confirm every uh, stent graft, which is patent, then completion angiogram. Okay, anyhow, the completion angiogram, trust, trust my word, um, <coughs> or trust me rather, um, there's no an uh, endo leak and has, um, uh, all the branch vessels are patent. And this is the beauty of it because it's really standardized procedure and where the endographs are designed for each patient's anatomy. So um, when we finish the cases, do we rarely have any endo, endo leaks? So quest to improve patient outcomes. I just borrowed the title. I'm not presenting his paper, but um, uh, Dr. Resch is really well known and Malmo is one of the highest um, center by number or volume. And there are much we can improve. Of course, ALARA, which is a well-known acronym in vascular ward, is as low as reasonably um, allowable or achievable, and meaning that we should use least amount of radiation as possible. And and as our operations get more complex, when we, we had to change the gantry angle to 90 degrees or so, we use more radiation. So it's really understanding techniques and when to use digital subtraction angiogram versus regular angiogram is incredibly important to decrease the volume. And I like the title here. It says, uh, you know, why the confusion? And fusion is another technology where we are trying to incorporate to decrease the amount of radiation. So the fusion technology is where we're doing angiogram and we overmask it with the preoperative obtained CTA and this way, without using um, fluoro, we can sort of see where the branch orifice would be. And many article has come about since its initial invention and its use showing its benefit. So control group where normal um, way of doing angiogram versus utilizing fusion in these cases have decreased radiation dose substantially. Of course, these are software-based uh, um, um, uh, technology. And this is the most advanced fusion system you can get. You know, AI is a huge word nowadays. What they do is we upload these CT scans, and they have a main server somewhere, I don't know, um, somewhere in the country, I suppose. And all these companies, uh, this particular companies, obtain images from around the world, and computer learns to how to plan these cases. And every time surgeons have to manipulate to match his uh, anatomy, a machine understands that change and would remember. So every time, because it's cloud-based system, you don't need to update because when their central server is updated, it's just updated. It's like Skynet in medicine. And, and they can, or, um, without having to, you know, early generation fusion system, we had to tweak a lot of these orifice and shooting angiogram matching those. But now, um, the rate of doing that and magnitude of readjusting has lessened dramatically. And so that's the use of AI in vascular surgery. Of course, a software um, improvement. Um, but you know, the days of doing simple EVARs are obviously very important. But for centers like us, it's not as important because it's not that we don't want to treat them. We simply don't see them. Um, and, of course, we're doing more compli uh, complicated cases and which uses more radiation. So this is one of the uh, slides that I borrowed from Mayo Clinic, and they have shown since their system changes, their radiation dosage has uh, gone down dramatically. And these are some of more newer machines where Siemens and GE and Philips has come up with their own clever way how to accommodate these uh, sharp angulation. This is basically a robotic arm, so that's part of robotics that we use in vascular surgery, where they move the gantry arm with the arm, literally. And this is sort of like R2D2, where it just moves around by itself with your control. And this is a Philips way of uh, designing with the two different articulated um, uh, joints. Next is spinal cord ischemia. This is a huge deal because, you know, imagine you had the surgery, and next thing you know, you can't walk. If you can't walk, not many people live very long. So that we know, right, from um, traumatic injuries to um, from the, obviously, vascular surgery. So 
So we had seen those open thoracic abdominal surgeries have very, very high spinal cord ischemia rate. Endovascular, fortunately, has lower rate. Um, this is the reason why we do stage interventions. Roy Greenberg, another Roy um, Greenberg article, actually is from Cleveland Clinic. This is uh, Matt Eagleton's um, paper. When they staged doing a TVAR and then doing the rest of the fenestrations month or later, they have shown that the rate of spinal cord ischemia rate is much, much lower. And this speaks, this is, you know, very important. You can see here, unintentional stage. Even when patient was unintentional stage, they did it better. So um, this is why when we do these uh, type 2 thoracic abdominal aneurysm repair, we stage them. And of course, there is more adjunct maneuvers that happens in the operating room. One is using SSCPs and, and really assessing lower extremity neurological functions in real time and changing physiologic needs um, in the OR. And for whatever reasons, and we do the uh, fenestra repair, and we detect change, and we don't complete the surgery. We leave certain fenestrations open in an attempt to perfuse that aneurysm. And as, of course, this pressure wouldn't be as great as it used to be, so we sort of condition the spine for eventual closure of it, and later we close. And, and uh, Mayo Clinic has been um, uh, working on this for now several years and with really great outcome where they don't always do spinal drains now. And this is post-operative management of spinal drain can be very confusing and it's very, you know, um, uh, requires a lot of attention from the nursing staff. And of course we know ICU is a very busy setting and, and one nurse cannot be sitting next to one patient to adjust these, um, the spinal drain management systems. So what, what um, this article is showing is a new um, device where the surgeon sets the particular parameters and machine drains spinal drain or spinal fluid in, in a preset manner. And next is, of course, stroke, because whenever we do endovascular surgeries, we're always concerned of causing stroke. And there are many different areas where we're studying, because particular grass when we um, deploy, there are a lot of errors in the graph despite flushing it very carefully. Um, and the error is actually proven to be cause of some of the, the strokes from endovascular procedures, in addition to plaques. And this is a very clever way of looking at it. By using transcranial Doppler, there is a way to differentiate between embolic material from the aorta and also embolic material of, uh, of, uh, from air. So, Next big thing is big alpha in the room in the United States is always controversial. It's not as much so in UK or EU nations now, except for UK since I think they're leaving. Um, so this, they have shown, this is UK's data, this is Germany's data, and for the ruptures, any surgeries, if you do enough, you really get good at it. And it makes sense, right? Um, practice makes perfect. But they have to publish on these because no one believes in it. Um, and they have shown that higher number for each surgeon as for an institution, the outcomes are much, much better. And I think at least for thoracic aneurysms, United States should trend this way um, because the surgery is very long and um, the post-operative care can be a very, very difficult thing to manage. So I think that's my, uh, that's, that sums up my talk and that's, thank you for your attention. Well, Dr. Yoon, that was really great. Thank you. Just really highlights it for anybody who doesn't know, hasn't been in the grand rounds in a long time. We're really thrilled to be developing a specialized aortic center here led by Dr. Rodriguez, who I think probably has so pleased to operate. Um, and Dr. Yoon coming to join that group. So really a multidisciplinary cardiac vascular to bring sort of the expertise of both of those disciplines together to really create something uh, special for our region that sort of didn't exist before. And so really have appreciated the combined efforts of the cardiology division and the vascular division to make this happen. Really um, also appreciate your uh, talking about the role of innovation in 
advancing care. And I think we talked a while back, we're at our resident, uh, the general surgery residency conversation about the importance of, uh, we haven't solved all of these problems, all of, you know, medical, our disease hasn't gone away. Uh, and we still incredibly need people who are uh, pushing the envelope to, to do new things. And it's difficult, as you say. Either people don't believe you at first, or it's, or first they're naysayers and are pushing back. And there's a great um, model, you know, first they, people, the observers say, we don't believe it. Then people say, well, really, I had that idea myself. And secondly, you know, finally it's, well, you know, I could have done it. So it's, it's really an evolution that's very common, of whether it's fetal surgery in my world, whether it's, whether it's these complex metastatic grafts in your world, and every area, trauma innovation, you know, not not taking out the spleen, you know, that is theoretical in its day. So, particularly in surgery, if we don't do this innovation, no one else is going to. The internists are not going to solve this problem. All right. So it's it's important. It's difficult. It it takes an institutional commitment that you know what has to be done under the auspices. And we're dealing with this and many areas in the department right now. What should be done under the auspices of a special, you know, FDA approval on what is really sort of standard of care, but others are using that in order to corner the market. It's our complex questions. And I think there's an innovation committee here at Davis that, you know, tries to help us grapple with this and protect our innovators as well. I think you do have, when you have oversight committees and things like that, even if there's a problem, if you've got the sort of support of your institution behind you, it makes it easier to move these things forward. And I, of course, lived through this in the early days of fetal surgery where people thought this was heretical to operate on the wound. Oh my gosh, you know, how do you do that? How do you put a graft inside a patient? So thank you for bringing this broad. It was a really excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions. Yep. Well, Dr. Mel. Two, two. Thanks. Two, two comments and a question. The first comment is really uh, tangentially related to the talk. Uh, if any of you have not seen the movie The Two Popes, I would recommend it. The great reason movie. for the, the Two Popes, <laughs> it's a great movie. And it really, it, it's obviously in the context of religion, but it really, it really highlights the challenges between traditionalists and progressives. And I think sort of the take home message is that you have to move forward in order, in order to maintain your relevance. And I think this is a really great example of how far we've come and where we, re we really need to be going. Um, second comment is, you know, sp spinal cord ischemia is, is an ongoing challenge with, with this operation. And when you see a lot of people who dabble in managing complex aortic disease, they dabble until they have a couple of patients who are paraplegic and then they give up um, because, it, because it is such a devastating complication. I will say here at, at UC Davis, uh, we've instituted a protocol that both Dr. Rodriguez and I learned from uh, University of Wisconsin, Dr. Aker, who's really one of the pioneers in, in, ma in managing and preventing spinal cord ischemia. Uh, his, uh, his results, though perhaps not that many, was more around eight or 900 cases, were really phenomenal in terms of spinal cord uh, ischemia. So we're really trying to focus specifically on that because I think long-term that's really important. My question for you is the challenge of where where we are right now and how we need to get to the next step. You know, there are, there are sort of two different um, camps right now. One are the um, the Pericles people, the chimneys and parallel graphs, and the other are the PMEX, the physician modified endographs. And you know, right now we have regulatory um, barriers for the physician modified endograph people who want to do physician-modified endographs, even though there's a great deal of data that supports, you know, that it's effective. Uh, without really going into the details of the history, where do you see this going and how do you see that, you know, this can be addressed so that, so that the expertise can be um, more read readily available to our patients? Right. So um, that's obviously a highly debated topic between parallelograph and the fenestrate endographs, but if you look at world data where the, these um, you know, highly uh, customizable graphs are available in Europe and Canada included in Asia, um, the, the number of parallel graph cases have actually gone down dramatically. 
that speaks to us because that's sort of a future of the United States because the countries where, you have, where they have these custom-made graphs are available, the, the number of these parallel graphs are actually have gone down, which indirectly tells us that the surgeons are in favor of doing a finisher endograph uh, because most of the time they're, in a way, standardized. Um, so I think if the graphs were available, readily available in the United States, then I think, um, of course, um, the number of parallel graph uh, usage will go down just like the world trend. Uh, in terms of um, uh, physician modified graph versus custom made graph, it's really the you know um, usage of a term, I suppose, um, because the way we um, custom made graph, but from a manufacturer, is also handmade. Uh, um, but of course, it's designed in such a way so that it's easier for us to do. So technically speaking, doing um, custom made graph is easier because of the graph uh, manuf uh, you know, prepar preparation is something that we don't have to do. And the graph is designed in such a way that it, in, technically it makes it easier. Um, um, but the problem is obviously, you know, our um, regulatory body, uh, FDA, wouldn't accept the foreign data. It's interesting what FDA would accept. For example, chemotherapeutic agents, certain drugs are you know, accepted with foreign data without having to run separate trials in the United States, whereas um, the stent graphs are not subject to the same uh, regulations, so that separate trial has to be run in the United States, which makes graph uh, availability very limited and very expensive because of it. Um, and of course, there's, you know, like, just like in medicine or wherever human goes, there's always politics. And, and in terms of where the stent graphs are available and what institution is highly regulated with people who are actually using them. So, uh, you know, imagine if you have particular stent graphs and you're getting certain referrals from these states nearby. Would you be wanting to have that stent graph be available to many centers? It's something that we don't speak about, but I feel there is that understanding where if you have these stent graphs before someone else has it, you have an edge. So, um, so there is a lot of competing interest in this uh, issues, and and of course, the, some of the trials are only granted at the centers we, where they have used many of their graphs. So um, there is many different you know, issues that we don't normally speak about, but we should perhaps address because at the end of the day, if I were to have a thoracal dominant aneurysm, I wouldn't want open surgery. And that's how it is because usually by the time you have a thoracal dominant aneurysm, you're in 70s or 80s. And quite honestly, I'd rather go with the rupture than have that open surgery. That's my opinion. And we know the data that's available. So it's, we have to be, you know, um, as a physician, you want to do no harm, of course. When you know that the outcomes are so different, but just because of regulation, would you treat one patient differently? When you know there may be a potential better option for you, for that particular patient. So it's really an ethical question, I think. Yes? That's a quick question. Just uh, over time. What's the role of, when I think about these complex graphs, what's the role of uh, the late, sorry, what's the role of laser printing of the, of the graph um, so that you can look at it in three-dimensional and play with it and then custom make a graph from a, a laser printed uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, obviously um, you're trying to say to Washington there is a particular surgeon there, Dr. Ben Farns, and he's actually have printed the 3D models of the important parts of it where the vessels are. And he would sterilize it. So days when he used to do physician modified graphs until you know before he was offered custom made graphs, uh, he used to use that model to you know make a fenestration on the graph, and and um, um, and then of course he spun it out to a separate company after, and which was recently sold to one of the endograph manufacturers. Yeah. So there is a role for that definitely, and. And you know, sometimes it's really hard to see in fluoroscopy, but it's one thing to see it in naked eye before you. So it's 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 really important for you for any of us to understand how the stent graft mechanism works because every manufacturer has different deployment mechanisms. And to see how that works in real life, I think there's huge educational benefits. I will say I was closed by saying that uh, the Department of Surgery invested with a couple of the other departments in 3D printing <coughs> or uh, modeling 
certain procedures, operations, Gary Rapp's involved. I know we're doing it for the conjoint twins that we have in the house that um, that sometimes just help you visualize things a little differently. So if anybody is interested in using that for, for an operative plan or anything else, I think uh, Ai-Jin Wang has been involved with that, you know, sort of helping us coordinate across the department. Thank you again for a fabulous presentation.